He is not only the one who created, it is in him that it exists. It's by him that it exists. It is through him that it exists. And he's the one who holds it all together. That means that if God had to be absent from you for one millisecond, not only are you dead, you will stop to have ever existed. Shh, man. What this is saying to you and to me is that nothing you've ever experienced, nothing you've gone through, nothing that's going on in your life, there's never been a time, there's never been a situation, there's never been a circumstance where God has ever been absent. He can't be. That's why Paul said, don't you realize in him, he was saying to these heathen people, don't you realize the fact that you can go and have a breath is because God's involved. Oh, hallelujah. Now, you know, once you can understand that, then then let's go to Exodus. How many of you understand that this is explaining God and this is truly telling you God truly is Almighty, all powerful, everywhere present, all wise God. He's the one who sustains all things, right? Well, you know, God didn't become this. God is not the one who became this God, He has always been this God. And this same God in Exodus chapter 34, go with me to Exodus chapter 34. Hallelujah. Exodus 34, and I'm going to read verse, from verse 6. Um, well, let, let me just lay a little foundation here. Exodus 33 is where Moses asked the Lord. He said to the Lord, how many of you realize that Moses, when he brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai, do you know that Moses did had no clue who God was. It's an astounding reality to me. It's an astounding truth to realize that, you see, what we do in retrospect, we we read the, the name Moses and we just assume that Moses, he knew God. Well, at this time, he has delivered the people of Israel out of Egypt by signs, wonders, miracles. He had, a, he had a miracle working ministry, but he comes to Mount Sinai, and this is what he says to the Lord. He says, Lord, show me now thy ways that I may know you. He says to the Lord, he says, Lord, you, you say you know me. You say that I have found grace in your sight, but you have not shown me who it is that will go with me. Now, you know, I used to always read that thinking, he's talking about, Lord, you haven't shown me what other man is going to go with me. No, 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 he's saying, he's he's referring to the burning bush where God said to him, now Moses, go and I will be with you. Now Moses comes and he says, Lord, you say I have found grace in your sight? You say you know me by my name? He says, I don't know who you are. Show me your ways so that I may know you. You know what God does? Thank God God didn't say, okay, well, come up here, I'll show you. (laughs) You know, God is infinite, right? Moses would still be on the mountain today. And he'd still be standing there going, oh, wow. That's awesome. So God doesn't show him his ways, doesn't show him how he operates, doesn't show him how he works. God says, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And that's where Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with it, I'm going nowhere. I'm not moving without your presence. But then he asks him the second time, and he says, now show me your glory. And the word glory there is the, is the Hebrew word that comes from the root word Shekinah, which speaks about the brilliance, the brightness. Show me your glory, Lord. Show me the fullness of who you are. And that's when God said to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you. 
So God, this is where God tells him. Well, here in uh, Exodus 34 and verse 6 is where God actually does it. Where God puts him in the cleft of the rock, puts his hand over him, and he shows him. But listen to how God introduces himself to Moses. Listen. It says, the Lord passed by before Moses and proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord. Man, that's a powerful. If you go and look at that in the Hebrew, the Lord, the Lord, the existing one. What God, what is God saying? He's saying, Moses, I am almighty God. I, do you realize, do you realize, I don't think that we always realize this. I know that I didn't, but you know, when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, the 10 plagues really was God triumphing over every one of their gods. So you've got to understand, here's Israel and Moses, all, all they knew, most of them knew, is that they knew the pagan gods. Then, and, and those pagan gods were nasty. And here is a God who's leading them out of Egypt, and he has now just obliterated all of the gods they know. This is truly Almighty God. And so God introduces, He says, I am the Lord, the Lord, the existing one. I am Almighty. I'm all powerful. But then He says, A God of mercy. He says, Yeah, this is true. I am truly Almighty, all powerful. If I would remove my presence, my, my, uh, a presence from you f for a millisecond, poof, you didn't even exist. There's no, there's no even history about you. This is who I am. But Moses, I want you to know I'm a God of mercy. I am merciful. I'm a God of mercy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Gracious. I'm a God of grace. Yes, I'm all powerful God, but I'm a God of grace and I'm gracious. Slow to anger. Can we say that together? Slow to anger. Long suffering. Slow to anger. What does it mean by slow to anger? You know, in, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says to John at the, on the Isle of Patmos, Approximately 2,000 years ago, he says to John, John, behold, I come quickly. Now, depending on your eschatology, 2,000 years has passed and Jesus hasn't come. Hallelujah. What that tells me is that in the mind of God, 2,000 years, approximately, is quickly. <laughs> I come quickly. 2,000 years has passed. He hasn't come yet. He could come tonight, but it could be another 1,000 years. But we can safely say that God's quickly, it's about 2,000 years. Could be longer. If God's quickly is 2,000 years, then how slow is he slow? <laughs> when he says, I am slow to anger. I asked the Lord one day, I said, God, what does this mean? And it's like the Lord said to me, Arthur, I want you to see, you can't live long enough to anger me. Now, I know that that goes against many people's, but you got to understand what God is saying. When I'm in relationship with you, you can't live. Even if you could live for 2,000 years without dying, that would only be slow. I mean, no, fast. Fast. Not slow. He's slow to anger. So he's saying, I am, I am merciful, I'm gracious, I'm slow to end, abounding in steadfast love. And then 
in the, in the uh, ESV, it says, and faithfulness. I believe that that's the only translation that's got that word correct. He says, he is slow to anger and bounding his steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, you know what that word in Hebrew, faithfulness, means unfailing loyalty. Moses, yes, I am almighty God. I am the one who holds all things together. But I am a God who is unfailing in my loyalty. This uh, word in Hebrew speaks about being able to put your support on it. You can bank on this reality that God is a God of faithfulness. He's a God of unfailing loyalty. Now later, if you go, now there's a lot more we can look at that passage of scripture, but go on with me to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Later on, Moses is now going to come and he's now going to introduce the people to God. Deuteronomy chapter 32 is known as a, a, a psalm of Moses. You know, Moses wrote psalms and this is one. Now, why did they write psalms? Well, one of the reasons they wrote psalms was they didn't have the written material. They don't, didn't have books. They didn't have notebooks that you could write in. So what they would do is that they would write psalms and songs in Africa. In, in rural Africa, it works the same way. They, if they want to pass on uh, history, they want to pass on culture, they want to pass on, uh, you know, truth. They would, they'd write songs and then they teach the people the songs. And then that would be passed on from one generation to another generation. And that's how truth or how culture was, was going to go on. So this is what happens here. See, Moses here, he's now writing a psalm. And listen to what he writes here. And he's, he's introducing the people of Israel to God. And this is what he says. He says, verse 1, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herbs. Now, just let's pause there for a moment. I want you to listen to what he's saying there. He says, I want you to hear my words. And I want these words to be, as it says here, to distill like the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herb. What, what is the sense that you get from what he's trying to communicate here? What I get is that he's saying, let the words I speak to you bring refreshing. Let it bring life to you. Let it bring a, 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 a sustenance to you. And then he starts off by saying this. He says, For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Man, that's powerful. Listen, this, the, uh, he says, I am going to proclaim. The word they proclaim means I'm going to broadcast the name of the Lord. That means I'm going I'm to broadcast so everybody can hear. Um, but what that also, if you go and look at it in the Hebrew, it means to broadcast the fame, the fame and the reputation by naming. So he says, I am going to broadcast the name or the fame of God by naming him. And then he says, the rock. He names him. You see that there? Hallelujah. So he says, uh, this is the fame of God. This is what is God is famous for. He is the rock. Now, th is he saying that God is a rock if we go outside? And he's a no, he's saying that God, that word there for rock is not a rock you find in the garden. And I, I notice here in Phoenix, there's a lot of rocks around. <laughs> 
but it's not that kind of a rock. It's like the rock of Gibraltar. It is, it is actually a solid, mountainous cliff face. He says, this is who God is. This is the fame of who God is in his faithfulness. He's steadfast. What, is, what are the qualities of a rock, of that kind of a rock? It's steadfast. It's dependable. It's something that you can put your trust in. It's something that's unchangeable. It doesn't change. You know, the Bible is full of that. It speaks about God being the rock of our salvation. He's the rock of our strength. He's the rock of our refuge. Jesus even said uh, that he is the bedrock of our faith. So he's talking about stability and strength and, he's, and, and, and dependability here. And Moses goes on though, he doesn't stop there. And he says uh, that God is a God of, uh, uh, who is the rock and he is the one who whose work is perfect. That word perfect means without blemish, without, uh, 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 without a, a blemish in it. Uh, all his ways are just, but more importantly, he says he's a God of faithfulness. That word faithful is the same word, unfailing loyalty. But Moses doesn't stop there. He says without injustice. And you know, for years I used to read that verse and by that time I kind of just go over that verse and the Lord said to me one day, He said, no, no, you need to go and find out what that word injustice means. And so I went and had a look at what the word injustice means and He says, God is a God. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. He is a God of faithfulness. And in this here, He is a God who is faithful, unfailingly faithful, without injustice. And the word injustice means no distortion. It means that He's steadfast, without break in relationship. And he is, that means, no hidden agenda. Oh, God. I want you to hear this tonight. God is a God of faithfulness, unfailing loyalty. When it comes to relationship tonight, God is a God of of unfailing loyalty without hidden agenda. I don't know how many people are here tonight, but I don't, I don't think there's a person in this place that actually understands what that means. You know why? Because I don't believe that any of us have ever experienced. We've never seen what that means. None of us have ever been in a relationship where there's no hidden agenda. We've never been in any kind of relationship where there's, where there's no ulterior motive. Every person that you and I have ever had any kind of relationship with are fickle. They change. One day they love you, the next day they don't. Now I can see some of you are sitting there saying, well, Arthur, you don't know that I have a relationship. And you, and you might be thinking of a relationship right now in your life, and I'm talking about with somebody that you know, a person that you know, that you say, well, I, that relationship is, is pure. This is the pure relationship. There's no hidden agenda in any of this. I, really? <laughs> you might be thinking about your relationship with your husband or your wife, maybe with your grandchildren, maybe with your, your children, Maybe with a friend. You really think that, that it doesn't have any hidden agenda? Let that person that you think you have that pure relationship with, let them just do something you would never expect them to do. 
and you will be in danger of forming the, the teapot. <laughs> After all I've done for you. Come on now. All the things that I've endured with you. I see that some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> amen. We all know that that's going to, that happens. But here, this is what God, Moses is introducing them and he says, listen, don't you realize that when you enter into a relationship with God, that you enter into a relationship with somebody who is unfailingly faithful, who is unfailingly loyal, and he has no hidden agenda. God loves you and he has no agenda in it. Oh God. He loves you and has no ulterior motive. It means that, that you, you cannot ever be caught out in the fine print. Anybody ever been in a, in a place where you've wanted a guarantee and then when you want to put down and say, I want to claim on this guarantee, they say, oh, well, hang on, you've got to read the fine print here. <laughs> see, see, when God is in relationship with you, when he says he loves you, when he says I will be faithful to you, there's no fine print. Now, to you, to, I tell you, for many Christians, that's like, oh, that can be. That's, that, that's who God is. You know what that means? That means that you will never hear God say to you, after all I've done for you. <laughs> and if there's anybody who has the right to do that, if there's anyone who has the absolute right to, to form the teapot and say, after all I've been through for you, then God is the one. He bankrupted heaven for you and for me. I mean, he didn't send an angel from the backside of heaven from a storeroom that nobody's going to miss. He sent the one by whom he created all things. So if, they, if, if God had to, he could. But he says, in my relationship with you, you can know this. Listen, you can go to, to hell if you want to. But you're never going to hear God say, after all I've done for you. He, he, you. What you will hear is, as you go and fall into hell, I love you. But if you want to go there, it's up to you. Come on now. You see... I want to end off the service by saying this. You might be here tonight in this last year that's passed. Maybe you have failed big time. Maybe you have failed morally. Maybe you have failed in business. You might have failed horribly in your relationships. But I want to tell you that God is saying to you and to me tonight, he's not concerned about your past. After all, the gospel is never about your past. It's always about your future. It's not where you've come from. It's where you end up. You see, I believe that God is, is making this, and, and I love this, because in, in Proverbs uh, 24, and verse 16, it says, for a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. You know, as a, and, and then of course it says, but the wicked are overthrown by calamity. Now you can choose to go the wicked way and be overthrown by calamity, but as a righteous man, a righteous woman, you can stand up. Yes, you're going to fall, but get up. Maybe last year has been a horrible year for you, but get up. 
Stand up. God is not holding that against you. He's not going to be the one who said, well, that's it. I'm, uh, I'm done with you. See, maybe, maybe tonight you have gone through a, a tragedy last year. Maybe you've suffered hardships last year. Maybe it's made you feel like God has left the building. Have you ever been in that place? When you pray, you say, God, God, God. Maybe it's made you feel that way. Maybe you've gone through hardship. Maybe you've gone through tragedy. But I want to tell you right now that God is the one that no matter what you've experienced, He is faithful, unfailingly faithful, and He is for you tonight. He is for your life tonight. Maybe you've felt like many people, I've... I've Let the opportunities go by. The window of opportunity I've missed. Maybe you are even here tonight and you think to yourself, you know what, I'm just, I'm just too old. I'm just too tired. I want to tell you tonight that with God who is faithful in your life tonight, there is always another opportunity. No matter how many opportunities you have missed, tonight is the beginning of the rest of your life. Amen. Amen. Tonight. I like what uh, Romans says, and if somebody wants to come, I, I want to really use this opportunity to do, uh, and if we can get some music here, but... You know, today God wants you and me to know that He can, He will still use you. See, I think there are people here tonight, you know that you've been called. You know that you've been called. You've heard about the Bible college. You've heard about opportunity to prepare and you know that you are called and maybe what you've done in the past is if you've ignored that and maybe now you think well I guess I've totally blown my chances the scripture says that God is the one that if he calls you then His calling is never removed from you. If He called you and you let it go, and you went on and did your own thing, I want to tell you tonight, His calling is without repentance upon your life. And He doesn't remove the grace and the call that's upon your life. And no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what the circumstances are in your life tonight, you can still make the decision, cooperate with God, and let Him show you His faithfulness. Let Him show you that your failures, your inabilities, your stupidity does not stand in the way of God to remain faithful to you and to me. I really feel that, that tonight, and I really felt as I prepared for tonight, that the Lord really wants to allow us to give you the opportunity. If, if, if what I've just brought to you right now about the circle, maybe you failed and you feel like you can't, you can't go on. You say to me, Brother Arthur, everybody has given up on me. My wife's given up or my husband or my family, my, my church has given up on me. I want to tell you tonight that Almighty God
hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on your passions. He hasn't given up on your dreams. He hasn't given up on your calling. He hasn't given up on your family. You know, there are people here, I just sense by the Spirit of God, there are people here and you, you say, man, I have messed up so bad with my family, with my, with my children. tell you is that God loves your children more than you do and if he was able to reach you who says he can't reach them without your help oh hallelujah we can trust in his faithfulness tonight